So I'd like to introduce today's speaker, um, which is Jessica Rudd from the University of Exeter, and she is going to be talking to us about her master's research on the basking shark. So thank you so much for joining us, Jess, and over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly um, to get this up and running for you. Right, so let's start with the first slide. So hopefully you can all see this all right. Um, I apologise if it gets loud on this side. We've got um, some work happening outside um, and also uh, the rain's about to start hitting here. We've got a balanced window, so if it starts getting really noisy, I apologise. Um, but it's um, it's really my great pleasure for to be here today and um, to talk to you, even though it's remotely, about some uh, this amazing work I've been involved with and some of the amazing projects that I've had the opportunity to um, that we collaborate on and just being able to witness the amazing life that are basking sharks really. Um, so what I just wanted to go through really quickly is the outline of what I'm going to be talking to you today. Um, so I'm just going to start off uh, with a little bit about myself and my background and then just giving you uh, a really broad introduction as to what are basking sharks and sharks in general. Um, and then from then what are tracking technologies as well. So I don't know how many of you may have never come across that term before and to give you a bit more background on that, um, on what those are. And then essentially how we've used tracking technologies in basking sharks with my research group over the last few years to really find out some really cool, really cool information about the sharks, but also um, this information has been really valuable to then help protect basking sharks. And then finally, just a little, a little tiny section on how you as a, as a, um, citizen science essentially can help um, with the, some of the projects which are ongoing and with helping with basking shark protection. So just to start off, um, just quick background. So I did my, um, my undergraduate degree and basically all my other degrees at the University of Exeter and I started off in 2012 and very much just, just as of Monday I found out that I'm going to be a student again. So for a, a good too, too long a period of time. Um, but I started off doing zoology at the Cornwall campus and then in Canada where I did a year abroad and um, worked at a research lab there. I came back to the UK and then did a very long master's um, working essentially on the use of accelerometers. So I'll tell you a little bit more about what those are, but which is a type of tracking technology in the conservation of both basking sharks and green turtles. Um, and then I've just been accepted on a PhD programme, which will be starting in September, uh, using these tracking technologies in basking sharks, leatherbacks and um, tuna. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but uh, apart from the university work I've done, um, I've worked in collaboration with quite a lot of um, research institutes, uh, but also kind of governmental bodies. So I did some work for the United Nations environmental programme and also some like commercial work with um, marine environmental consultancies too. So a broad range of things, but research has really been my key focus and what I'm really excited about. So just start off really quickly before we even dive into the rest of the talk, I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask just to see how many people might know how long sharks have actually even been on the planet for. So I think someone is going to be putting up a poll in a second. Um, here we go. So just these are completely anonymous. And if you want to think how long um, they've been around for, just to get an idea. Amazing, we've got loads of votes so far. Just so you know, these polls are completely anonymous. So do not be afraid to take a guess. So if you get it wrong, it does not matter. Um, guessing is always a great thing. Brilliant, We've still got a few extra seconds. I'm liking your results so far, everyone. Well done for those. I will let you know who's got the right answer in a second. Um, shall I give it a few more? Just uh, give it 10 more seconds or so. Oh, we've got 96. Well, just one person hasn't voted, so I'll just go with the answers. Actually, well, it's over 400 million years um, is how long uh, sharks have been around for. And I think that's such a cool fact that actually they've been so that some of the oldest sharks are still around today, uh, but obviously not the same ones that were have been alive all that time. But you do get some extraordinarily old, um, old sharks like Greenland sharks. But what's amazing is that they've 
they've been around longer than like flowering plants. So it's really incredible what what they've been um, what they've been through um, evolutionary and how much of the world's changed they've seen. But also considering how long they've been on the planet for and how much change has happened just in the short period of time and how many of the species that we have today are actually um, globe kind of in in the face of extinction because of human. Um, uh, human activity and so one last question well actually not the last one just for now is um how many sharks do you think you can find in uk waters shark species not actual sharks Give it a couple of more seconds. There's a few people who haven't voted, just to give them the chance. All right, well, that's amazing. So actually 40 is the correct answer. Well done, everybody. Um, so yeah, it's amazing. We've got a huge amount of um, sharks which are just found in UK waters um, and this. Um, which is amazing. So we've got this huge variety. So obviously basking sharks, um, but it's incredible. I never thought that there were just this variety of sharks. And so you really don't have to go anywhere exotic to see such a range of incredible sharks. Um, and that's not even including the skates and rays that we also get. Um, and so it's amazing actually just what biodiversity we have right on our doorstep. And some of them obviously will be you find a lot uh, deeper and some of them you might come across um, a lot more um, easily but it's just amazing really to highlight what biodiversity we have um, and hopefully if you do even though it's the orca project which is uh, the marine mammal um, conservation but a lot of citizen science projects that they do through that is also looking at um, monitoring like, sharks as well. So just to give you a little bit more background on sharks, I don't know how many, now you know how long they've been around for. So sharks are actually um, predecessors, I don't say the word anymore, um, your bony fish, your teleos. So their skeleton actually is made of bone, it's cartilage. So the same kind of material that you have in your nose or in your kneecaps, for example. Um, and what kind of sets them apart from, from bony fish is that they've got this amazing jaw, which actually isn't fused to their skull. Um, they've got these, their skin isn't this, is made out of these different kinds of scales. So if you've ever had a chance to like run your hand or been licked by a cat, it's that kind of similar texture. But they've got these rigid dorsal fins um, as well as um, some incredible organs that help them essentially kind of exploit the ecological niche in which they are. So um, bony fish, so that could be anything from like your tuna and salmon, they'll have something called a swim bladder. So it's that big if you've ever gutted a fish um, to put on a barbecue or something, you might hear a pop. And that's um, essentially a kind of a big air filled sac in their body. And that actually helps them float. So sharks don't have this, um, but they have to kind of essentially help them with their buoyancy and stop them sinking. They've got this really, really liver. And that's actually come to the demise um, in, um, in the few past centuries because of the exploitation um, before electricity was around. Um, when, say, like what you did with um, what happened with whales and whaling for their, their, their oily blubber, um, shark livers were also exploited to, um, in order to kind of make um, fuel and, and lighting. Um, but they've also got these really amazing. Um, different organs so on their rostrum so that's their nose they've got you might see like the little spots that they have that kind of look like freckles and these are called ampullae of Lorenzini and what this helps is detect electrical signals um, and so whether that might be um, signaling to um, the other like, conspecifics to other other sharks or whether that's helping them detect prey um, and they also have like this lateral line so if you you might see on the it's quite thin this thin line I think you can see my mouth um, which kind of crosses horizontally the shark's body, which also helps um, with detection of like um, electrical signals and pressure. So compared to like these bony fish and humans, for example, so they, sharks can't actually hear. Um, and so they don't detect with that, um, with that 
they don't have ears as such or, or as bony fish they don't have that swim bladder so the swim bladder helps essentially feel like pressure change and so they can hear like what direction a, a, a sound might be coming from sharks with this lateral line can see essentially can, can feel whether it's like a wave displacement or or um, some kind of change in electrical components happening in the water. So I'm going to go on to now basking sharks. So these are amazing animals. Um, they are the world's second largest fish and they are the largest um, shark that we have in the UK. Um, and so they, they can actually, they're on average the same size as a double-decker like London bus, just to give you an idea of how massively big these are. Um, and if you see here for scale, you've got the little diver there um, in comparison to um, your larger adults. And um, these are what we call obligate ram filter feeders. So they need to, they have to keep swimming. Essentially, they can't stop. Like some, you might see, you might have seen documentaries or seen it in real life where some sharks have kind of like buried themselves under a rock or something or resting. Sharks have to keep swimming. In not, um, so basking sharks, they have to keep swimming in order not only to feed. So they, this is not to scale, but the little plankton, which is at the bottom right hand, this um, bottom left corner. Of this picture here. Um, so they, they will filter feed through these big, big um, kind of clouds of zooplankton and that will get, they get stuck in their, their gill rakers, um, which are kind of covered with this mucus that they can filter and, and then um, feed and digest with. But they also have to keep swimming in order to get the water to pass over their, um, their gills. So where you'd see some species of fish which have like these they are perculum, so those bits covering the gills and you see them kind of like ventilating like that, that allows the airflow to kind of go to move over their lungs, um, not their lungs, their gills. Um, but so yes, sharks, these basking sharks have to keep swimming forward. Um, and also their, their liver will help them, so as I said, not, not sink, but they also have to keep swimming in order not to sink as well. So quite, quite strange creatures. So what's really amazing with basking sharks is that they're usually solitary, but they form these massive like, aggregations up to sometimes hundreds or thousands, depending on where you are in the world, um, where they come together, um, usually in the summer months, to form these big like feeding aggregations. And so in the UK, we are really lucky to have a number of these aggregations where um, starting really between April to like September, depending on where you are in the country, um, you might find these big sightings of basking sharks um, coming up and feeding on these massive blooms of zooplankton um, and feeding at the surface. And the name basking shark is because they think that originally thought that they were coming up to the surface to bask in the sunshine, but actually it's really that they, their prey is concentrated in the top bit of the water. Um, and then they're just moving forward with like their mouths open and just also feeding for large parts of the day. Um, but it's not really understood why they kind of form these massive aggregations. So here we can see, for example, um, a number of sharks following each other. And so is this to do maybe with hydrodynamics? Can they find a way that they, as one shark swims forward, the other uh, plankton that they miss um, kind of falls back and then the sharks behind it can like scoop up those bits of food? Um, or could it have some other bit different meaning? So are these aggregations possibly um, a, a social kind of behavior. So we'll, we'll look at that in a second. So basking sharks have got this big like certain global navigation. So in the map here on the right hand side, the, the, the blue outline in the ocean is essentially where basking sharks range has been estimated. So um, that's basically left out in white is kind of taken over by um, whale sharks, which kind of have the same ecological function of these big filter feeders and tropical waters, um, apart from that poles. So you find them actually on a massive, massive scale. Um, and as a globally, and actually more, more so, even more so in the Northeast Atlantic, so where that red box is, I hope you all know where um, you are in the world, um, and the Northwest Pacific, the um, population of basking sharks is um, considered, or had not considered, has been like measured as endangered because of two centuries of overexploitation and then more recently bycatch. And so they've been exploited, as I said before, for these those oily livers, which um, were really used for fuel. And if you think the, that liver will kind of 
be exponential will grow exponentially with the size of the shark so it was beneficial for um fishermen to target the bigger shark so that they um they were massively in decline following um all that um, exploitation um, and then more recently even though since um, since 1998 um, basking sharks have now been protected in UK waters so you're not allowed to fish with them and then more recent as recently as 2007 um, the EU has banned all, all fishing of basking sharks in European waters um, but they have sent, since also been um, have had a number of um, like protective laws against them so the CMS, that's the Convention of Migratory Species, so it's a big binding agreement um, for people, for countries which fall within those territorial, um, for which basking sharks fall in the territorial waters that the sharks are protected within those seas, um, as well as CITES, which is a Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, so um, you're not allowed to, to buy or sell um, parts of a basking shark although um, there is still illegal trade going for um, their fins and being one of the largest shark species they have a very large dorsal fin so these are quite heavily targeted in some parts of the world um, so because of that they are endangered but their population has um, kind of remained stable within the northeast atlantic for the last couple of decades so at least that's a good um, good bit of news There we go. Um, one interesting thing, I, I don't know if any of you have seen in the news recently, but there was a big flux of basking shark sighting early on the year. But even though they've got, they are these gentle giants, which only feed on plankton, they've got the most minuscule, ridiculous, tiny teeth. They are still conveyed by a lot of newspapers of these big, terrifying beasts. Um, sorry to point out a lot of it's a mirror um, or the star, um, but give these poor, sharks a lot of bad press so even though they haven't been persecuted per se they are still giving um these negative images uh to these basking sharks which really won't do anything to you at all um so it's don't don't believe everything you read um and advocate for like, protection for these sharks rather than um terrifying beasts that they really are not so um, you can see here, this actually, this is a shot that was taken one summer that we're doing some field work on the shark. So as much as they're big, they're large dorsal fin, you also have part of their caudal um, fin, which that's their tail, which sticks out the water and which makes them quite char um, char charismatic, charismatic, but characteristics, that's what I was looking for, um, to spot. So it's not your kind of big jaws, um, great white shark type of dorsal fin. Um, because they do come up and feed at the surface you tend to get quite a lot of sightings compared to um other shark species that you might not come across quite so uh, frequently and because of this because of these um like these sightings that you might get from a boat from a cliff um that's been able to collate all these records of these sightings from both scientific surveys as well as um, just public sightings which have been recorded to have an idea of what the, the distribution of these basking sharks are. So on the left hand side here we've got a, a map of the UK and Ireland and from these sightings alone just at the surface um, we can gather from this these really main hotspots of where basking sharks are found. So um, down the southwest of the UK, um, as much as the Isle of Man, the west coast of Scotland around the Hebrides, and the west coast of Ireland. But one thing to remember is that um, basking sharks, like any fish, um, don't breathe air. They 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 get their oxygen from filtering the water, so they don't they don't have to come up to the surface in order to be seen. So all of these sightings and records and population estimates are only really based off what information we're getting from these visual observations and a lot of this is um will really be um influenced by what the weather might be if it's a really wavy day if it's if you're off the coast or as you can see the number of sightings like off at sea are a lot and um, a lot lower than around the coastline um if it's night time if it's dark any of those um any of those um 
things will actually influence what kind of sightings you're going to be able to see. So although here we've got another little plot which shows uh, the number of like, portion of sightings for those different areas, so whether that's the west coast of Scotland, the Isle of Man or the southwest of England, those trends that there's, there's been an increase in sightings um, since I think it goes up to 2008 in this particular paper. Um, we are that's really only showing us the tip of the iceberg because you don't actually know what's happening beyond uh, underneath the surface. And so <laughs> I know this is turtles rather than basking sharks, but this is the oldest um, bit of tracking technology that I could find. Um, this is where tracking um, and the use of technology has come immensely uh, handy to find out a lot more about the biology and the ecology um, of a whole range of species, but most importantly, marine species, because once they're below the surface, we just don't know what they're doing or where they go. So this is actually Archie Carr, who was like the leading um, sea turtle expert um, based in Florida, and who did his first big um, tracking studies on loggerhead and, and um, green turtles and um, off, off the Caribbean um, um, using helium balloons. And since then, in the last 50 years, technology has increased a fair bit, but has allowed us to answer all of these questions that we um, just a, didn't, didn't even think we had, but also has opened up these whole new array of things that we might want to understand and then help answer to protect so many of our marine species. So that this is just to give you an example of what, um, what tracking technologies are um, and how they can help with these ecological issues. So in the top um, section of the screen, these are, this is in a terrestrial environment, but a lot of these technologies are used also in, um, in the marine environment. So biotechnologies or tracking technologies are essentially um, a range of different tools that you can use in order to infer um, anything from like um, animal movement, uh, behavior, physiology. So that could be anything from like heart rate, hormonal levels, um, stress content, things like that. Um, it could be also picking up, um, you could be also monitoring aspects of the environment. So whether you're looking at um, the, the temperature or the depth that an animal, the, the height that an animal is flying at or diving to, um, using drones to survey large areas, um, and also kind of putting these different types of technologies on the same species. So then you could infer, for example, there's this really cool technology I haven't had the chance to use yet, but I'd be really interested in too. They're called um, like business card tags, which essentially say you've got shark number one, let's call it Bob, and then shark two is like John, and shark three is Sally. You can tell when Bob has interacted with John or Sally, and you can make these whole in, um, inferences of um, these ecological networks um, and how knowledge might be transferred or competition and all sorts. Um, and it's really in the last 50 years that this um, has really like, boomed um, in terms of, of, of the, the tools which have been developed, but also in terms of what we can do with this, because it's one thing sticking um, a tag on an animal and just putting out to sea and getting information back for the sake of it. It is interesting, but why, why are we catching this animal? Why are we sticking something on them? It, they are always better off if we leave them alone but you hope that the information that you're getting back from, um, from these tags will help protect the species as a whole and understand it better um, and help kind of change laws or, or policies in order to help protect those, these species. Um, so just going on from there, you've got, you've got different types of, as you can see here, different types of technologies, but depending on what kind of information you want to get and how big the animal is. So, what was a, a big limiting factor with tracking technologies was um, the size and like the battery life, for example. And so because of how things have become more and more um, digital, things have got smaller. So basking sharks actually were one of the first ever animals tracked because they were so big that the, the weight or the size of the tag that they were using wasn't going to affect it as much as if you were to stick um, a giant tag on say like an arctic tern which um, you try and you try and make sure that the tag is at least three percent mix as much as three percent of its body weight so if you had an arctic tern of 100 grams you could only stick on something on it 
which was less than three grams. So that really does restrict either how, what, um, what kind of data you might be collecting. So you can't stick on like a camera and a GPS and a, like a, a heart logger. Um, you might only be able to collect one of those things. And then also the battery life. So how long are you going to be deploying um, this? So you might be collecting quite high resolution. So meaning you're getting really, really frequent um, points, really, really frequent measurements um, over a short period of time, or you could be collecting a lot coarser data. So for example, if you're tracking something over large distances, you don't need to know exactly where it's going like every second or every minute, because you want to see what it does over like a year. So these are the kind of things that you need to trade off in order to, um, well, you what question you're going to be asking, what you want to find out eventually, but also what kind of tools you're going to be using on these animals to get as much as you can out of the data in order to help that species. So basking sharks, back to basking sharks. Um, this is a range here of these different tracking technologies that my group has used in order to track basking sharks. So that ranges from these um, PSAT tags. So you've got things which are what you call, which transmit data and things that you have to, the tag you need to get back in order to download that data. So. For example, you've seen satellites in the sky, possibly thinking it's a shooting star. A lot of those actually, in, which are launched in space, um, collect data on wildlife. And so with these tags, you essentially buy like a subscription to that satellite. And every time that satellite passes your animal and your animal happens to be at the surface, that's the issue with, um, say like GPS technology, is that it requires an animal to be close enough to the surface um, in order for it to transmit that data, its position, um, like you would on your phone and you're trying to find directions through that satellite in order to say where it is. And um, so that helps collect the data in real time. Um, but then you're also limited to a species that can be a lot more successful for say like um, a whale or a turtle which, or a bird, which has to come up either to breathe or is in the air and can transmit its data a lot more frequently than say a, a fish or a shark. Um, then the other kind of data that you get is archival data. So that what happens is that once you put it on the animal, it stores all that information on that tag, but it doesn't transmit it back to say like a base station or to that satellite. So you have to actually be able to pick up that tag, retrieve it in order to um, download all that information back from it. And so that can be quite tricky. So either that might pop off an animal and you have to then try and find it, or you have to collect, you have to try and find a way to um, find that one animal again. Um, and so there might be a range of different ways that it's either got combined like a satellite tag or a radio tag on it, so you're not finding, just looking for a needle in the haystack, but it does sometimes feel like that. So with all these huge range of technologies which have been, um, which, uh, have been developed, this has helped us over the last few years and people around the globe, not just my lab group, um, to really discover a whole lot of new things that uh, from basking sharks that we wouldn't just be able to find out from just those surface observations that I talked about before. So that's literally ranging anything from like the foraging behaviors at the surface, what kind of, um, how long they might be feeding for, whereabouts they might be feeding, um, information about their migration. So there's been, there's been records now of, of basking sharks uh, crossing the Atlantic or crossing down um, past the equator from, from up from Canada down to Brazil, which is incredible. Um, but also apart from these long distance migrations, them coming back to the same location the following year, so that interannual site fidelity. So they're coming back to that same location, uh, even if they've like migrated these hundreds and thousands of kilometers, which is incredible. Um, it's given us more detail about where we can find basking sharks in the UK, what their distribution is, how long they stay in an area for, um, which is quite hard to, um, to tell just from a, like a single surface observation, for example, we know how long they might be in an area, but also when you combine like where they're hanging out and how long they're hanging out in a place for, like why, why are they in that location and what, what is it in that environment or that habitat um, they like, and you can infer what kind of habitat they prefer. So whether that's associated with um, water temperature or the prey availability, like the zooplankton, um, how deep it is. So then you can start inferring like on this um, right hand 
um, plot here, what are the best environments for those basking sharks? Instead of having to survey like the entire UK, you can focus your attention at those specific um, places. And then you can find out a lot more kind of fine scale behavior. So like this diving. Um, so here we've got um, a plot of, of diving behavior of a shark. So the, the y-axis, the, the horizontal um, axis is time and um, the y, so that's the x-axis, the y-axis, the vertical one is how deep it goes. And so here you can see that over time, you've got this really rhythmic diving behavior over the 200 meters depth. Um, and that it could be this, this prey searching. And so basking sharks are known to have what's called um, vertical style migration. So they're following, they tend to come up, depending where they are, when they're close to the shore, they tend to, it's the opposite, they'll come up at the surface during the day and then will go down at night. But in kind of open oceanic systems, um, it tends to be the other way around. And that kind of happens to be because of um, how the, the zooplankton is mixed in the water column. And, they match essentially what the plankton is doing. Um, and that, what's really amazing is that it's been found with these tracking technologies that basking sharks can go up to like 1500 meters deep, which is just amazing just to think about what physiology they have in order to help them like dive those depth and for those periods of time. So one of the things that I've essentially been working on um, is looking at um, more their kind of more fine scale aspect of the behavior. So the bits I was just talking before were kind of a lot more coarse, like large scale, where the large distant movements or these kind of interannual patterns that you're seeing. So what I what we really don't know very much about is their social behavior. What how do they reproduce? Do they have breeding sites? Um, all of that. And that's particularly important because as an endangered species, you want to protect not only um, like foraging grounds, but you want to also protect where possible breeding sites might be in order to help that next generation um, come along. Um, and so one of these things I mentioned before were these big foraging aggregations. So basking sharks tend to be um, um, it's often of social, not unsocial. Um, I've got a mind blank, solitary, there we go. Um, for most of the year, apart from these um, these big summer foraging aggregations, uh, which happen in those parts of the UK, I pointed out before. Um, and so even though these kind of, these are likely to be for some, to some extent because of this, this large aggregation of food, but this also it might be an opportunity for sharks to be able to interact with other sharks and could possibly um, be an opportunity for these sharks to actually um, to breed, to mate, and then maybe the, that these might also be breeding or puffing grounds. Um, and so the kind of behavior that you see in these aggregations compared to say when they're swimming out in the open ocean is quite unusual. So whether it's close following or, um, or breaching. Uh, so could breaching actually be some sort of courtship display? So this is one of the elements that I was look really closely looking at for my masters is breaching behavior. And so breaching is essentially an animal which propels itself out of the water. And a huge, actually a really large range of species do that, um, whether that's cetaceans or other um, elasmobranchs, so shark and ray species. Do it. But in, it's been found for, for cetaceans, so dolphins and whales and orcas, for example, that they might do this for communication. They might do this for fun even, um, for group cohesion. But these are a lot more social animals and that communication is important. Um, in other kind of shark species, um, they might be breaching out the water because they're ambush predators. So you might have seen that really amazing slow, slow motion footage of, of a great white shark coming out and um, eating a seal, um, fetish sharks doing something similar. In, um, in manta ray, they've been seen to breach, but this is actually thought possibly be uh, courtship behavior. So maybe basking sharks, which filter feeders have no reason to jump out of the water to ambush prey, could this possibly be linked to some social courtship behavior as well? So to find this out, it's like how do you go about A, looking for this breaching behavior, which is really quite sporadic? Um, how do you quantify this? Um, and so what we did was we stuck what we call, here you can see on the animal, and that kind of yellow light bulb looking thing on the um, uh, right hand side, that's a, um, a daily diary. So what this is, essentially, it's a bit like a Fitbit or the, um, the technology which is in your, um, 
in your phone, which helps you look at how many steps you've done. Um, and that from that, you can actually infer a whole range of different behaviors from the movement that an animal is doing. So it records behavior movement, I should say, from like left to right, up and down, and then um, front and back. And this gives you a whole range of squiggly lines, essentially all these different patterns, but what swimming looks like, so a shark is kind of swimming along, that will look really different to say a big massive breach. And so you can start picking out these really specific patterns to say like, oh, this shark is breaching this many times. And because we also attack, attach what you, you can see that little red, what's called a spot five tag, that's a, 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 like a GPS satellite tag. Um, so we can find out not only when the shark is breaching, but where the shark is breaching. So that helps if it is to do with this courtship display, we can then see where this mating behavior is happening and then also hopefully infer what um, possible breeding grounds are and um, if we can protect those. So here's a quick video of an actual um, basking shark which has been attached, uh, which has been tagged by, there's my mask on, by a camera. Um, and so if you're, if you don't like, if you get a bit seasick, maybe don't watch this because it's it rocks all over the place. Um, but it's kind of the shark swimming from depth and then is kind of propelling itself. You can see its tail beat faster and faster. Um, and then coming up to the surface, it's getting lighter and lighter. And all of a sudden, the splash, very quick, <laughs> this massive splash. And then the shark is kind of coming, it's finding its way back to depth. So that is actually one of the first ever breaches recorded um, by a full breach recorded by a basking shark. Um, and just this is kind of outlined with less kind of flickering and moving around. So here we've got the different stages of this um, of this ascent. So here we've got the depth plot. So the, the shark kind of started diving from about 65 meters from on this along the seabed was coming up. So we had, along with these tags, it's recording not only that movement, but it, had, it was recording speed and depth too. So you can see um, it's really clearly propelling itself out the water. We've even got a shot of it out of the, out the, off the surface of the water before diving back down. So this is really exciting. Like why, why are these sharks doing this? And this is just to give you a quick kind of illustration of what it is. So actually we found that full breach in kind of its day-to-day -day swimming it roughly a basking shark roughly swims about a kilometer an hour so it's pretty slow humans roughly walk about three to four five depending on your, your speed so they're very very slow animals and then from an average um, of about 19 meters de depth it will kind of all of a sudden start this really rapid um ascent to about 10 kilometers an average on 10 kilometers an hour on average and sometimes it can reach up to like 15 um, uh, kilometers an hour, propelling itself out of the surface of the water, doing this little spin, which is actually about one and a half times faster than those great white sharks, or in human perspective, faster than Michael, three times faster than Michael Spelt's like gold medal um, at freestyle, in which he won a few years ago. Um, before then, the shark then goes back, had a kind of a, a slower pace back to the seabed and does the same thing. Um, and so as, as much as kind of quantifying the speed at which it's swimming, we can also be able to, with that kind of, that Fitbit um, technology, we can derive how expensive that behavior is. So how much energy they were spending in order to do this breed. So this comes to say like, so if it's really expensive, um, they shouldn't just be doing this behavior for no reason at all. Um, it's they especially if they they spend so long foraging and um they are slow moving animals if it's a really expensive behavior then it has to have some sort of benefit towards them and so before i give you that answer i want you to kind of estimate how much um food basking sharks need to eat on a day-to-day -day. so i've kind of broken this down as to how many big macs they would need to eat so if any of you want to vote on how many big macs of um, basking sharks require. This is on their day to day, not just their breach. Thank you for everyone who's already voting. Look at that. So I'll wait a few more minutes, a few more seconds. Maybe another 10 seconds or so. 
All right, well, you got 76. So actually, um, the, the, the right answer is between six and um, 10 Big Macs. Um, they're, so they, they actually have to spend about 14 hours a day in order to meet their energy demand. And that depends on how much plankton is um, in the water available at that time. Um, but yes, that's equivalent to six or 10 Big Macs. So um, in colder water, so because they're temperate sharks, um, their <coughs> sharks don't regulate their, um, their body temperature uh, like mammals do. So they don't produce heat um, through, um, well, not to a huge extent at least. They, they in colder water, their metabolic rate is um, reduced. Uh, so if, if it was in a, in a hotter environment, then they would be, have a lot higher um, demand. So their food inc um, amount of food that they would need would increase massively too. So it's actually not as high as we possibly think, but um, to a single breach, that would require about the same amount of calories as an apple. But um, we found one of the sharks breached. So out of all the, the sharks that we were tagging, um, we managed to actually record 67 breaches and all together, so quite a few breaches. And one of them um, produced 60 breaches in, in, a, in a month, uh, which was amazing, and up to six in a day. So when it's when it's breaching six times a day, that's about five apples worth of calories, just, just in case you need to know. Um, but because we also got those GPS locations for when some of those breaches were happening, so here I've color coded the locations of the breaches depending on um, if it was a single breach, a double breach, or a triple breach, because they were actually not only jumping once um, out of the water, you could, we actually got a breach. One of the sharks breached four times in 47 seconds, which is insane. Um, just thinking about how this really slow animal is propelling itself multiple times um, at the same kind of rate of, of speed and energy. Um, it's like if you run a marathon and then you decide, well, you might actually like, oh, I'm going to take a break now sit down that shark just keeps going so it's amazing um but what this map highlights essentially <coughs> if you look at the bottom right corner um the blue out outline there was the proposed marine protected area and uh, with the red box kind of highlighting where these two islands um Isle of Col and Tyree um are situated in the inner Hebrides and that all these breaching locations actually um uh, smack bang in the middle of this what this marine protected area was so if if breaching is a sign of courtship display and is that this is possibly a, a breeding ground then we're actually um this marine protected area will actually do the trick and um is would be successfully protecting um this behavior so why is a shark breaching? So it could be courtship display. So as I mentioned before, sharks don't have ears. And so they wouldn't be communicating through sound per se, but they could be because of the water displacement they produce during their breach, um, could kind of convey how big they are or how maybe if they're ready or they really don't want to mate with um, another shark. Um, but it also, basking sharks do have, um, do have parasites, they do have lamprey. So you can see in the bottom right picture there, there's actually that poor shark's got three lamprey stuck to it. So they could be trying to remove parasites, but breaching um, is unlikely just to have one reason in, in cetaceans and in other sharks, they are likely to, they, they breach for multiple reasons, but because of that high energy demand um, and the fact that they're not using it to ambush um, predator, um, they're not an ambush predator, it has to have some sort of benefit for them. So that might be a reason for it. Um, and then I'm just gonna whiz through some really quickly because I realized I spoke quite a long time about preaching. Um, some of the other projects we've been working on. Um, and so this has been, we worked in collaboration in 2019 um, with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute um, in the US. And <coughs> so a bit of a bit of background there is that they use, their essentially marine engineers and they've come up with this AUV. So that's an automated underwater vehicle. So it's like a drone, but underwater and um, it's completely autonomous. Um, and so it kind of, it, it does its own thing, but what it does is it follows this beacon here. So that this um, kind of rocket looking thing you've got on the right hand side um, is uh, a tag that you, you have to still attach on the shark. And that kind of emits this, uh, signal that then the, the Remus, this, this big um, underwater drone, then follows. And what it does, as you can see, here's a bit of a technical image of it. It's got um, five cameras. It's got one in the front, um, left and right, bottom and 
up and down and then also sometimes a rear facing camera too, which we had on one of the, on one of the deployments. Um, and it's got a little propeller and then it follows essentially the shark. So you're basically watching the shark kind of completely apart from this, this beacon here, but it's just the sharks doing its own thing. And so what was the issue with the, the, like the breaching work that I was doing with the accelerometer, although well, we were getting all this amazing fine scale behavior, we didn't have any context to why it was doing. We didn't know whether um, we could see where in the water column, so whether it was, it was possibly at great depths or close to the surface, but we couldn't tell if there were other sharks around, was it kind of being harassed by something? You just didn't have that environmental context. So the work with, um, with, with Sol was to try and get a bit more information about, could we try and see the breeding happening um, in real life? And so here, just to give you an idea of that's the size, that was a beacon. So if you want a crunchy bar as a kind of estimate size, it gives you an idea of how massive these sharks are. So um, here is, I'll show you, hopefully this will work. I have a YouTube video just of the findings. Here we go. Um, and I'm just gonna whiz through it really quickly. But um, essentially what this is, is a, so switching all the cameras to have a look as it gets deployed, goes and follows the shark. Um, and then we can have an idea. So I'll just skip through all this bit's just watching the data. But um, essentially, oh, get away. We're, we can get this footage of this basking shark. So we really don't know very much at all about its kind of subsurface, really, what's happening fine scale, uh, what the context is. So here, for example, we've got the remus is following um, the basking shark. And from this, we can kind of, we can start looking at how, how fast it's beating its tail, what kind of habitat it's finding itself in, whether there are other kind of fish which might be associating with it, or other different kind of species it might come across. Here you can see, actually, you can see uh, Underneath the shark just then were like the lamprey attached next to um, cloaca. That shark here was um, just feeding. So you can estimate kind of feeding periods of times as well, which is already more of that like those energy budgets, how many Big Macs do they really need to eat? Um, and here, these are just some screenshots from, from the Remus, which didn't make the actual clip, but um, we've got these different kinds of um, <coughs> jellyfish which have attached itself somehow onto onto that the underwater drone it came across a pod of dolphins and here we've got an image of um it was filming the shark feeding so we could have an idea about how how long that shark might be feeding for and what it's actually doing so on this particular um these deployments we actually didn't catch basking sharks breeding but we did have a bit more of an idea of of what it's doing when it's when it's not at the surface which is really exciting um, and the first kind of time that we've been able to deploy it and follow a basking shark like that and just have a completely different environmental and social context of what we might be seeing in that other tracking data. And last bit, um, I realise I've got food, I think, on the side of my mouth. Just when you're working on a boat all day, just try not to be seasick, you're just feeding yourself the entire time. Um, but this is um, a toad camera. So this is a different kind of, um, this is like an inside shot on the left hand side. Um, of the camera. So you've got uh, the little bit at the top here that's recording temperature and depth. It's got a front and back facing camera. And then this bit here is uh, a GPS tag. So when the, the, uh, the camera breaks the surface, it's recording its position of the shark, but also this is attached to the shark on a, on a you can see some of the, the, the what you call it, the tether. Um, it's tethered onto the back of the shark here. So the camera isn't a scale on the shark. The, the camera itself is probably about what you in my hands. Um, and so it gives you here an idea of the, the front and rear view of what it's looking at um, of the shark. And um, from that, this is just giving a different, this is actually the shark's view of what's happening compared to the remus, which is following it. The, um, the cameras here are essentially just tracking um, the shark all the time as they're getting lost or anything like that. Um, and so this is this is actually work that I've just finished writing up, um, and it's just, just been accepted and it's going to be published within the next hopefully few few days or so. Um, but um, and this is giving so I can't give you too much information because it hasn't been released yet. Um, but um, what do you think these basking sharks get up to? Um, and so what kind of information do you think we've got from that footage? Um, 
So this is another poll and hopefully you might have some ideas of what they might be doing. So do they, did we find them sleeping? Do they attack other species? Do they not do anything at all? Or do they not do any of those kind of aforementioned things and do they do some mystery kind of behaviors? So up to you to think what they might be doing. give you a couple more seconds. We've got a few more, see if you can get a couple more voters out there. All right, well, I'm going to end the poll and you're right, they do do some sort of mystery behavior. We didn't see them sleeping, um, didn't see them attack essentially any other species, although did have one um, instant where the, um, the shark kind of was like snapping because um, some of the fish it was following. So they often their, their, their tail, their caudal fin gets trailed by lots of other fish. Um, I think it, probably one tried to peck it a little bit too hard and it wasn't too happy. Um, but yeah, so there was a quite interesting mystery behavior um, happening on there, um, which hopefully if I can actually change the slides, here we go. So we did the first deployment in 2018, and so this has been released, but we also did some 2019 footage, and so that will be coming out soon, so do watch the space for some of it. But what was really exciting Sorry, Jess, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but yeah. your internet seems to be going a bit. It might be worth turning your video off while you're playing this video. Can no worries. Uh, let me see. So my internet is stable. I apologise for that. Let's see if I can. The shark was. Um, was associating with actually how much time they spent on the seabed because you we say that basking sharks are you think of them always at the surface but actually a lot of the time they were on the seabed um, and um, having an, a bit more of an idea of like why are they actually down there and we found which was incredible um, some footage essentially so obviously you can't record at night it's all dark um, but really early behavior, we saw the shark the first time ever being recorded, the basking sharks kind of interacting with other sharks on the seabed. And we saw up to 13 sharks over like five minute clips. So we had no idea that this is what was happening, um, that they were spending so much time. Here again, there's some of that shoaling behavior from some fish, which are just kind of at depth, uh, following the shark essentially. Um, so I can, I can share the link with that if, if that didn't work. Uh, got some, some amazing footage back and things that we had no idea about. Um, and so it's kind of highlighting the importance of that there might be quite a lot more going on um, in the Hebrides than we should expect. They might not just be going there um, to, to feed. Um, and so the, the, this, all the work with the University of Exeter had been in consultation with the Nature Scott, which is an advisory to the Scottish government about this proposed um, moon protected area in the Sea of Hebrides and that finally kind of approved um, last December and so all of that um, you can see the map it's quite um, that bottom the biggest bit the big there were four new protected areas in Scotland which were established and the largest one is this is the first uh, protected area specifically for basking sharks and minke whale which is um, just really exciting great news that all of this like science has contributed to showing that um, how important this area is for these sharks and hopefully helping those numbers increase over time if we help not only protect their foraging grounds but also these possible uh, mating grounds or whatever these grounds are they they look like they're really important to to these basking sharks and so just to finish off quickly um there's ways that you can help as well so tracking technology is quite hard to get into there's quite a lot of technical and they're also really expensive so it's not the most user-friendly type of um type of tools but the the shark trust has got this amazing project ongoing project uh, which they've had for the last 
well, since 2003 over the UK and Ireland and where you can record your sighting. So I've got the, the link here and I think it's been shared in the chat earlier. Um, but um, if you if you come across a basking shark um, and you can share where it is, that really helps with those estimates of when they first arrive, how long they're in the area for, and like what highlighting what these possible important areas might be um, for these sharks. And hopefully we can keep making connections with their migratory species, keep highlighting these important areas for them and help make a network of protected areas in order to help the species recover. So I'd just like to say thank you to my amazing team and my supervisors. Um, and I know I've been speaking for quite a lot, um, but to answer any questions, if you would like, and I'll just sharing my screen, put my camera back on. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jess. What an amazing talk, an amazing project. And it's great to see your work come to life um, after so much time spending it. Um, so if anyone has got a question, if you'd like to virtually raise your hand, um, we probably have time for one question from the floor. And we have a couple of questions in the chat as well, which I'll start with. Um, so the first question that I will pick is, do we have any maps comparing sightings to blooms? And is there any evidence that they do in fact follow the blooms? Yeah, so there's there's been a number of work, uh, a few studies um, which have looked into this. So um, the one that I mentioned with the sightings, um, that was done by my supervisor in 2012. So it's, it's a few years old now, but that was kind of a long um, period of time that it was uh, the time frame that it was actually looking at. <coughs> The sightings and actually with that shark bust um, new sightings that kind of nearly covers this new period now but there's a lot of overlap with them um, that I don't know if you can remember from the slide where I had with all the different maps and studies which had come out the far right one was what was a um you call a uh what's it even called um it's niche modeling so essentially it's kind of modeling the best type of habitat for the species so what's really great with um zooplankton is that they feed on, on plankton which produces a level of chlorophyll a which gets um which you can measure from satellites from remote sensing so the same way that you get those kind of scary satellite images of how the sea surface temperature has changed over time you can also track essentially these um how much chlorophyll so how essentially how much plankton there is in the water and then by overlaying those sightings whether they are the, the actual basking shark tracks from the tracking technology or the sightings um, in space and time, you can see that massive overlap. So they really do follow it. And if you look from any of that, hopefully that the uh, YouTube videos did work, but I will post the links from them. If you often look at um, just pictures of, of basking sharks in the water, uh, they often look blurry because that's there's just this amount of plankton which is in the water and so they're really high concentration so they are following these big plankton blooms essentially. Great. Um, Ren, I can see you have your hand up so if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question to Jess, um, the floor is yours. Um, uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you Jess for the, the talk, it was fantastic. Um, so I don't know how many uh, people in this uh, talk will be in the same boat as me, but I have a bit of a background in marine biology. It's something I want to keep working on as well. I've left university and I have a master's degree, but I'm sort of looking to continue on in marine science um, and sort of remote sen sensing of things like basket sharks or other like megafauna is something I'd really like to get into. Is there any like skills or courses um, that you could recommend or even any like avenues where you could get experience outside of you know it have it being a master's project for you to work on yeah absolutely that's a really good uh, question ronan um so i'd say there's two really valuable skills which should be helpful for that so as you kind of talked about remote sensing um and what goes hand in hand really with remote sensing is uh, is mapping so if you've got any if you have had any experience of either using ArcGIS or QGIS, which is I would recommend if you haven't done it before, QGIS is better because it's it's free. Um, ArcGIS you require a license and a lot of if you want to work with an NGO or um, companies and such, the ArcGIS licenses are so expensive that maybe they they tend to be reserved to university, so it makes it a lot more accessible and you've got a lot more. Um, it's a lot more transferable if you learn in Q. Um, uh, there are a number of courses online which are free to use it. Um, I was helping actually my supervisor earlier this year to translate one of his modules from, um, 
from ARC to QGIS and the, um, there's loads of free tutorials on YouTube because it is free. So many people kind of create their own packages and all sorts. Um, and there's loads of those tutorials online. Um, I actually did, after I was in the kind of similar position to you where between my undergrads and my masters, I knew that this is something I wanted to get into. Um, and I wanted to get some kind of additional experience. Future Learn is a really great website uh, for a range of different different like courses, which um, are free. Um, and that could be anything from like Japanese cooking to like I did one on, um, uh, it was monitoring the oceans from space and that was hosted by the European Space Agency. Um, and so it's all online. Um, you can do it at your own pace. Either you could do one ahead of time and um, you, you can like all, it's all like it comes out every week or you can just do it at the end. You do it at, at your own pace really. And you can either pay for like a certificate, but if you just want to do it, um, you don't, if you don't need a certificate, you can just do it, which is great. Um, but the other one that I would really say, which is useful, apart from like the mapping side of things, um, is learning a programming language. So if you can learn R, most uh, that's again, is a free, um, free like statistical platform or programming platform that you can use. And um, again, because it's open source, um, there's a lot of a lot of tutorials online for that. Um, and FutureLearn also have like a range of, of those. So I don't know if, if um, FSE also have some of these courses um, that I could point towards. Um, but those would definitely be the most valuable. And they are really useful skills both like this, this mapping and the programming are really useful if it, academia wasn't the route you wanted to go down, but say, for example, working for, for NGOs or like um, uh, cons eco um, ecological consultancies, those um, are really useful because they do a lot of like environmental impact assessment surveys where they might be kind of having to produce maps um, of, of like, um, it could be tracking data or all sorts. So those are really, really useful skills to have. And it takes, a bit of time and effort if you haven't done them before just to kind of to do it proactively but I couldn't recommend those more um, because you can just use them for such a range of things and if you are interested in carrying on in academia um, for a lot of uh, masters or PhDs those are the kind of core things which um, which are kind of looked like sought after and I think they're the most kind of they'd be the, the best and like employability skill wise as well that you could you could get to I would say okay. oh thank you very much that was a brilliant answer and again thanks for the, the talk it was great no worries thank you for your question Perfect. So just looking at the time, we are going to have to cut it there, I'm afraid. Um, but if you do have any further questions, um, what we can do is we'll see if Jess is happy to maybe answer them later um, for you. Um, we can sort that out, I'm sure. I'm happy um, if you like an email or anything like that. I'm happy to take questions. Perfect. Yeah. So if you are interested, if you do just let us know, we can um, sort that out for you. Um, but Kieran has just dropped a link. Actually, we do have several QGIS courses coming up with the FSC. And if you are aged 18 to 25, I think our four topic course ends up being about £10 for you. So a really good opportunity wow. if you are wanting to learn those courses um, from leading experts in the field. So definitely have a look but thank you so much everyone for joining and for Jess for your incredible talk and for your words of wisdom um, I'm sure a lot of people found this very interesting and helpful for them thank well thank you so much for having me and for everybody it's been a, a long a long slog so far but really loved it and absolutely feel free to to email me I'll, I'll drop my email in the um in the chat box if anybody does need questions I didn't get around to answering um do feel free to, to drop me an email. I'd love to help. It's, it's a field of work that I'm really interested in. If anybody's like early career or is looking at getting into it, I'd be really happy to, to answer any questions there.